little background fact. When I was asked to teach tonight, they asked me to cover the conversion of the jailer. So we're just now getting down to what I was supposed to cover. <laughs> and uh, we'll try to highlight that and then uh, go right back really over the material that we've already looked at in regard to our tendency sometimes to make statements or get in our mind if we never say it. An attitude toward people that might eliminate them from us going to them. In Acts 16, the background, you remember, Paul was on a journey along with Luke and Silas and some others, and a vision came to Paul of a man in Macedonia saying, come over into Macedonia and help us. And they concluded that God was thereby calling them to go there, so they went on, and that brought them in this passage in Acts 16, if you want to be turning there. And you remember, he first went out to a place of prayer, and there was a lady there by the name of Lydia, seller of purple, whose heart, it says, God opened for the word. God knew her attitude, and truth was planted. She and her household obeyed the gospel, and then Paul actually and the group were urged by her to come and live at her house, which they did, and then other events unfolded there at Philippi, and that's what we're going to be covering in Acts 16, beginning in verse 16. This is after the conversion of Lydia. Verse 16. I'm going to read it, and then we'll highlight it over the same territory we've already covered of some of the thoughts that have popped in people's minds as to how to relate or not relate to others. Verse 16. It came to pass, as we were going to the place of prayer, that's where they met Lydia, that a certain maid, having a spirit of divination, met us, who brought her master's much, get that word much, gain, by soothsaying. The original word on soothsaying, montano amai actually means one who practices heathen arts or presents an oracle, and that's part of about what she's doing here, but can also then be, hence, a false prophet. That's the lexicon background to this soothe saying. But she was following after Paul and cried out, saying, Pretty good statement. These men are servants of the Most High God who proclaim unto you the way of salvation. Can't find anything wrong with that. But it bothered Paul because she is the wrong type person to be an advertising agent when she is a false soothsayer. And he didn't want to tie his reputation with her reputation or her means of making money for many. And so, this went on, it says, for many days. And Paul then, being sore troubled, wrong advertising agent, turned and said to the Spirit, I charge thee in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out that very hour. And it made a difference when God reacts upon a person it's always, unless it'll be after judgment day or punishing someone for their wrongs, it'll always be good. Now when our masters saw that the hope of their gain, that's all they were interested in, was gone. They laid hands on Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace before the rulers and when they had brought them unto the magistrates, city officials, they said, These men, being Jews, do exceedingly trouble our city. 
and set forth customs which it's not lawful for us to receive or to observe, being Romans. They probably were overstating the case there. Christianity would have blended in with the general rules of about any government. But sometimes government officials and certainly someone upset and losing their money alter the truth or the facts a little bit. And then the multitude got everyone roused up, rose up together. There's some unity there, but unity to do wrong against Paul, Silas, and the others. And the magistrates rent their garments off of them and then commanded to beat them with rods. And when they had laid many stripes upon them, they cast them into the prison, charging the jailer. Now we're down to the one we want to study about. To keep them safely. Who, having received such charge, cast them into the inner prison and made their feet fast in stocks. But about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns unto God. And the prisoners were listening. And suddenly there was a great earthquake. So that the foundations of the prison house were shaken. And immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's hands were loose, bands were loosed. And the jailer being roused out of sleep and seeing the prison doors open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul cried with a loud voice saying, Do yourself no harm, for we're all here. And he called for lights and sprang in, trembling for fear, fell down before Paul and Silas. He knew who had been singing, who had been praying. He brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus, and thou shalt be saved, thou and thy house. And they spoke the word of the Lord unto him and all that were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night, sometime after midnight, washed their stripes, was baptized, he and all his immediately. And he brought them back into his house, set food before them, and rejoiced greatly, having believed in God. Now there's the story. Come back now to the ten factors. People aren't interested in hearing the gospel in this day. If you look in Acts 16, 19 in that reading, you'll find these people not only didn't want to listen, they reacted, took them before the rulers and then before the magistrates and ended up with them being beaten and so forth. I don't believe you'd say that they were really interested in hearing the gospel, but some one did. So be careful about the environment just cutting you off from everybody in that territory. Number two, if I spoke to them about the gospel, they'd be upset. Well, I guess the magistrates and the rulers were at least because they had them beaten with rods. That's a little more upset. You and I may have been upset about a few things, but I doubt if we've ever gotten rods. I doubt if there's anybody here has gotten rods after anybody. But they did. And yet, was there an open door here anywhere? Part C. If you upset people with the gospel or talking about religious matters to them, they wouldn't obey it anyhow. Well, many did not, but some did. In fact, remember Lydia and her household before that. And also, don't forget this. If you were to look down in verse 40, after Paul and Silas were released by these people, finding out that they were Roman citizens and they had beaten them, which was contrary to the Roman law. They let them go, and it says they went 
to the brethren. And then when you look through the New Testament, does Philippi ring any bell in regard to the books in the New Testament? That Philippian church is one of the most commendable congregations, according to what Paul wrote, of all the churches. They were the ones that reached out to help Paul and support him. They had bishops and deacons and became a great church. Where was that? Right here where we're finding maybe some good reasoning for some to say, no need to spend your time there, go to another town. Got to be careful about marking off places. Part C. If you upset people with the gospel, no, I've already covered that. Part D. I hesitated to go because I wasn't feeling well. <laughs> what about Paul and Silas? They'd been beaten with rods. I went to the prison where Paul was supposed to have been kept in Rome. I don't know how it was here at Philippi. But I'll guarantee the jagged rocks and all down in that area where you'd have to sit down. They didn't have any benches or anything. You sit on slabs of rock. And if you had your feet fast in stocks, that doesn't give much squirming room. And how hard were they beaten with stripes on their back? Do you think they might could have said, I've had a hard day. So... I wasn't feeling well. I don't see how Paul and them could have, but I believe when it comes on down to verse 34 and it said that the jailer and his household rejoiced greatly that Paul and them was rejoicing a little bit too. Got to be careful about marking off places. The time to talk to them just wasn't right. Well, I'll tell you, I've often talked about Service going on a little bit longer right now. I'm about to run out of time probably and I'll have to quit and I'm not through yet. And uh, if I went to midnight, how many of you would stay with me? <laughs> I see one back there. We, well, uh, this was sometime after midnight because it was midnight when they were singing and praying and the Bible class took place after that at a house away from the jail. I don't know what hour it was. But I doubt it's the time you'd normally have a Bible study. Now, I'm not suggesting you've got to start ringing people's doorbells and waking them up at 3 in the morning and say, I want to study with you. But I'm just saying we could say, you know, this isn't the right time. And that didn't look like it was there. Talking about the gospel needs to be done when things are peaceful and quiet. Now, I don't know... I've heard earthquakes are about like tornadoes that make a lot of noise. It sure wasn't a peaceful night. Been cast into the inner prison, feet fast in stocks, after midnight, earthquake. I don't believe I'll go out tonight. But they did, didn't they? Not only did, but look at the results. I had too many things go wrong that day for me to study with anyone. Had to go to court before rulers, then magistrates, then beaten, then taken by a jailer and thrown into the inner prison, an earthquake. Quite a few things weren't going that nice, but did they take the gospel to someone anyhow? Number H, unless people are thinking clearly, there's no need to talk to them. Look in verse 27. He's about ready to kill himself. Well, if it's a suicide victim, he don't want to waste time there now. They're not ready. Better be careful. That might be the best time. Number I, part I, I never go to that person after what he or she did to me. Well, of course, the jailer, you know. Didn't say he carefully walked them into the inner prison. He cast them in there. Cast would indicate they were hardly able to walk from the beating. And then put their feet fast in stocks. That's not the way you treat a neighbor or a guest at your house. Part J, there are some people you can just mark off as being ready for the gospel. You can't 
expect people to change overnight. You see how that fits, don't you? Overnight, he went from suicide to salvation, from casting men to rejoicing greatly with his house. Well, I got down to almost this third point now. Richard H. Sume stated, we were not converted to be introverted. I thought that fit this lesson pretty well. Then Ian H. Murray adds, there's not the slightest hint in the New Testament that evangelism is the special prerogative or responsibility of office bearers. We are to be burdened for men's souls, not because any office requires it of us, but because we're Christians to be like Christ. That's why we try. Remember Luke 19 and 10 says what he came to do, seek and to save, save that which is lost. Those are the footprints we follow. And I like this statement then by Virginia Larson. There's only one answer to man's deepest needs, only one source of life. Therefore, if I know Christ and have studied the Gospels, that makes me either a missionary or a cop-out. As you look over these statements and know your own life and how much going you have done with the gospel, you can measure whether you have been more like a missionary or a cop-out. can be kind of sobering. I think of one thing I didn't put down here, but I want to just give emphasis to it because this gospel, brethren, does make a difference. So it's quite surprising after World War II when one of the first countries we went into with the gospel was Germany. There was a young man there that was converted and baptized by Brother Otis Gatewood by the name of Dieter Alton. Dieter, some five years after the war, shot Otis one time when they were walking along and he looked right into Otis's eyes and he said, Otis, did you know if I had seen you here five years ago, I would have killed you. This makes a difference. Christ makes all the difference in the world because in Christ there's a world of difference. And we've got the privilege of helping people see the better side of living, thinking, hoping, serving. And you can rest assured that it was with a great deal of passion that Dieter Alton, when I heard him speak at the Abilene Christian Lectures, included in his lecture the song Harvest Time that is in our books, Arise, the Master calls for thee, Arise, the harvest days are here. No longer sit with folded hands, but gather far and near. The noble ranks of volunteers are daily growing everywhere, but still there's work for millions more than for the fields prepare. Arise, arise, the master calls for thee. Arise, arise, a faithful reaper be. The field is white and days are going by. Awake, awake, and answer, here am I. Has the bell rung? I didn't think it had. I'm not going to quit until it's got to. Brother Norman Gibson was a man that in many ways educated himself, though he did do some college work, was in charge of a school of preaching at one time. While I was teaching at Sunset, he was on the faculty with me along with some 18 others. And he came in one morning and eyes 
might have had a little red streak or two in them. Just looked like it'd been a hard night. But he had a smile on his face. He said, well, it's been quite a night. The night before, he had baptized a man in Christ who made a statement to him, and he couldn't get it out of his mind. He couldn't go to sleep. He got up and started writing. He had written more than one song, and he wrote this song. I talked to a man about Jesus. He listened with wondrous surprise. Then I felt the start of pain in his heart when he asked me with tears in his eyes, where have you been for so long? Why didn't you come to my door? Just living in sin so long I have been. Why didn't you tell me before? I told him the Lord came from glory to bring down salvation to men. He joyfully heard the wonderful word, then wept as he asked me again, where have you been for so long? Why didn't you come to my door? Just living in sin so long I have been. Why didn't you tell me before? To all the whole world tell the tidings that Christ is the life, truth, and way. So when time is done and judgment has come, no one in that throng may need say, why did you wait so long? You see, there's one other poem there on the outline. I put this on about the last page of the book I wrote on Restoration Revival. It's over, I guess, on page 371, 372. Some of you have the book. But it closes out with what we've been talking about tonight. I don't know who wrote this. Picked it up from a church bulletin. Give us a watchword for the hour. A thrilling word with ample power. A battle cry, a flaming breath that calls to conquest or to death. A word to raise the church from rest to heed the master's highest request. The call is given. You hosts arise. That watchword is evangelize. The martyred saints now all proclaim through all the earth in Jesus' name, all the earth. This word is ringing through the skies. Evangelize, evangelize to dying men of fallen race. Make known the gift of gospel grace. The world that now in darkness lies O oh, Church of Christ, evangelize. And as Warren W. Wiersbe said, you're a Christian today because somebody cared. Now it's your turn. I hope this might help us to try to Serve well the Lord. There's another song that was in one of the older books. Someone is needing your help. Someone is sad and lone. Someone is weary and weak. Someone is almost gone. Drifting away. Dying today. Someone is someone you love. Why do you wait? Ere it is too late, point them to heaven above. Someone is wandering away, traveling the paths of sin. Someone should find them just now. Someone should bring them in. Someone's looking to you, watching your life each day listening to hear your glad call, 
waiting to learn the way. Someone is losing his soul. How can you silent be? Watching the life lights go out. Lost for eternity. Drifting away. Dying today. Someone is someone you love. Why do you wait? Ere it is too late, point them to heaven above. Go tell the gospel. It's God's power unto salvation to everyone, to the Jew and also for to the Greek. Have the bell rung. Oh. <laughs> well, I can remember growing up in the cotton fields of West Texas, and I had about enough vision to go to the next row. <laughs> and then headed off to Abilene Christian. They said, they might make a preacher out of you if you go there. I said, no, they won't either. <laughs> and some might say, they sure didn't. Uh, but, <laughs> <laughs> but I was majoring in electrical engineering. And when I was a junior, I shifted my major over from engineering, though I was making pretty good grades, to Bible. And that changed the rest of my life. And I began to, as a preacher then, you know, hope to have a gospel meeting. I finally had one, about four or five hundred of them. And 